on the evening of Wednesday, May 15th, 1887, as I was about to retire to rest after a hard day of professional work, I received a message requesting me to proceed to Berlin to see His Imperial Highness, the Crown Prince of Germany. No hint was given as to the nature of the case, about which I had heard only vague rumors. I reached Berlin on the afternoon of Friday, May 20th, and drove at once to the palace, where I found rooms prepared for me. His Imperial Highness received me most graciously. He spoke in English with scarcely a trace of foreign accent, but his voice, his voice, <coughs> his voice was little better than a gruff whisper. His voice, his voice was little better. His voice was little better than a gruff whisper. His voice was little, his voice was little better, little better than a gruff whisper. A gruff, gruff whisper. A gruff I was taken to a room where I found Professors Gerhardt and von Bergman. Professor Gerhardt described the condition of the prince's throat. There was a small growth on the left vocal cord, which Dr. Gerhardt had tried to destroy with galvanocautery. <laughs> Professors Gerhardt and Tobolt gave a positive opinion that the disease was cancerous, and Professor von Bergman agreed with them. All three were unanimous in thinking that a cutting operation would be necessary for the removal of the growth. I said that there was nothing characteristic in the appearance of the growth, that it was quite impossible to give a definitive opinion as to its nature. The first thing to be done was to pick off a piece of the growth and have it examined. Microscopically, by an expert, the proposal came from me. had not taken the very first steps towards establishing their diagnosis on a scientific basis. It was here that the jealousy of my German colleagues first took origin. <clears throat> the proposal came from me. One way or the other, 
one way or the other, the other, or the other, one way or the other. I repeat, I repeat, I gave no opinion one way or the other. I did not say that it was not cancerous. I only said that in the absence of positive proof, I refused to sanction dangerous surgical procedures. I repeat, I repeat, I gave no opinion. I gave no, no opinion, opinion, no, no opinion. I did not say that it was not cancer. I did not say not. It was not. It was not cancer. I did say it was cancer. I did not say not. It was not cancer. I repeat that I gave no opinion. I repeat, I repeat, I repeat that I gave no opinion, no opinion. No opinion I gave not. I repeat that I gave not. I gave cancer no opinion. I gave, I repeat. No opinion. When Professor Gerhardt told me that he had used galvanocottery, I naturally understood him to mean that he had employed it to the recognized rules of surgical practice. So when I was informed that he had applied the red hot point to the interior of the larynx every day for nearly a fortnight, I could hardly believe it. There is no record in medical literature, so far as I'm aware, in which the cautery was so horribly misused. I do not say he actually caused the cancer. Whether his ruthless cauterization actually caused the cancer or not, there can be little doubt that he is largely responsible largely responsible largely responsible largely responsible A largely largely responsible for the perichondritis which played such an important part in this sad case. I do not say he actually caused the cancer. On October 28th, the surface of the tumor became slightly ulcerated. This was the last time that the crown princess was ever to hear the sound of that beloved voice. I informed Dr. Brahman that I did not think it would be safe to put off the operation much longer. The operation was fixed for 3 p.m.
I was very anxious when I saw the kind of cannula that Dr. Brahman had inserted into the trachea. It was very long and also the largest tube that I had ever seen inserted after tracheotomy. Any practical surgeon will see that the instrument was exceptional in every respect and widely differing from the ordinary full-size cannula. The lower and back part of the instrument caused a wound in the posterior of the trachea. Later, Dr. Brahman showed me two other tubes. I told him this was scarcely a case in which it was desirable to try an experiment with a new kind of cannula. And it would have been better for Dr. Brahman to have used a tool which experience had proved to be useful. <laughs> had proved to be useful. I do not say he actually caused the cancer. On March 15th, a large slough came away from the deepest part of the wound. It seemed to consist of broken down tissue from the trachea. This destructive process was no doubt the consequence of the pressure of the large and unsuitable tube which had been the source of so much suffering to the august patient who was now Emperor of Germany. April 12th, Professor Bergman asked the Emperor to sit down. Without making any remarks, he quickly undid the tape, pulled the cannula out, and with considerable force endeavored to insert it. The instrument was forced into the neck, but no air came through it. The Professor withdrew the tube. This was followed by a violent fit of coughing, and there was considerable bleeding. To my consternation, Professor von Bergman then pushed his finger deeply into the and tried to insert another